Good morning. And welcome to worship on this Memorial Day weekend. A joy to have you here, both members and visitors alike. And we also welcome those who are joining us by means of Facebook today as well. We'd love to know that you have joined us, so please leave us a comment or like us there on our Facebook page. In the Apostles' Creed, we confess that we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints. Communion, really a common union. And, and even though we who gather here at our congregation, we who gather within our synod, synod, even though we have many different likes, although we have many different interests, we have one common union. And that common union is our faith and trust in Jesus Christ as our Savior. That is the focus of our worship as we gather together here this morning. We have the opportunity for Pastor David Newman to be here as he preaches here today. Um, and he will focus on those words of our gospel lesson for the, the sermon today. We'll begin our worship service with the singing of hymn 458. We will stand for the singing of the final verse, and you can find those hymnals underneath your seat, or you can follow along as it is projected for you in front of you. God's richest blessings to you as we join our hearts and our voices together in praising and worshiping our Lord. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins to God our Father, asking him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins, and trusting in my Savior Jesus Christ, I pray, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. God 
God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us and has given His only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by His authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. In the peace of forgiveness, let us praise the Lord. Be to God on high and on earth. Be Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, your Son, our Savior, was taken up in glory and intercedes for us at your right hand. Through your living and abiding word, give us hearts to know him and faith to follow where he has gone, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. Our first lesson comes to us from the book of Acts, chapter 16. We read verses 6 through 10. And we see how the early Christian church and the apostle Paul goes out into the world sharing the message of Jesus Christ. They went through the region of Phrygia and Galatia because they were prevented by the Holy Spirit from speaking the word in the province of Asia. When they went as far as Mysia, they tried to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. So they passed by Mysia and went down to Troas, a vision appeared to Paul during the night. A Macedonian man was standing there, urging him, Come over to Macedonia and help us. As soon as he had seen the vision, we immediately made plans to proceed to Macedonia because we concluded that God had called us to preach the good news to them. This is the word of our God. I invite you to turn to page 67 in your hymnal, and we join together in singing Psalm 8 there. Please note we will sing it responsively. I will sing the first part of the verse, the congregation the second part of the verse. We will all join together in the refrain and the glory be to God. How much? 
majestic is your name in all the earth. Consider your heavens. What is man that you are mindful of him? Our second lesson comes to us from the book of Revelation, chapter 22. We read a select portion of verses. When we consider unity, oneness, a communion of saints, we recognize that that communion of saints, and especially when we think of the Holy Christian Church, that the Holy Christian Church is different than the visible congregation. The Holy Christian Church is made up of only believers. And only the Lord knows who belongs, for sure, to the Holy Christian Church. The visible congregation is something that is visible. We see the people who are there. But we also recognize that within the visible congregation there might be hypocrites. People who pretend to believe but do not. It will not be until the last day, when our Savior comes again, that those who truly believed in Jesus Christ as Savior will be revealed. We hear of that last day in our lesson, and we pray for Jesus to come again. We read, Look, I am coming soon, and my reward is with me, to repay each one according to what he has done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes, so that they may have the right to the tree of life, and so that they may enter through the gates into the city. Outside are the dogs, that is, the sorcerers, the adulterers, the murderers, the idolaters, and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to give you this testimony for the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright morning star. The Spirit and the bride say, Come. And let the one who hears this say, Come. And let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who wants the water of life take it as a gift. The one who testifies about these things says, Yes, I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. This is the word of our God. Alleluia, alleluia. Christ is risen, he is risen indeed, alleluia. I will not leave you as orphans, I will come to you, alleluia. Alleluia, alleluia. 
Please stand. The Gospel from John, chapter 17. I am praying not only for them, but also for those who believe in me through their message. May they all be one, as you, Father, are in me, and I am in you. May they also be one in us, so that the world may believe that you sent me. I have given them the glory you gave me, so that they may be one as we are one, I in them and you in me. May they become completely one, so that the world may know that you sent me and loved them even as you loved me. Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am, so that they may see my glory, the glory you gave me, because you loved me before the world's foundation. Righteous Father, the world did not know you, but I knew you, and these men knew that you sent me. I made your name known to them and will continue to make it known, so that the love you have for me may be in them, and that I may be in them. This is the Gospel of the Lord. We confess our oneness in faith with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated, and we continue with our next hymn, hymn 167.
Peace be to you, from God our Heavenly Father, and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The words for our meditation are those recorded in the 17th chapter of John, beginning with the 20th verse. Listen to those words again, as Jesus prays. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one, I in them and you in me. May they be brought to complete unity to let the world know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory you have given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. Righteous Father, Though the world does not know you, I know you, and they know that you have sent me. I have made you known to them and will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them and that I myself may be in them. This is the word of the Lord. Fellow children of God, through faith in Christ Jesus. Each of you has different talents and abilities. Our personalities also are different. You have different backgrounds. Your interests also are diverse. Many are the differences that exist between us, and yet, despite those differences, there is one common bond that unites us all. And that uniting bond is trust in Christ Jesus as our Savior. Let us grow in oneness of our faith. Jesus spoke in prayer the words of the scripture on the night before his death. He with his disciples had eaten the Passover meal and were soon to leave together to the Garden of Gethsemane. And there Jesus would give himself into the hands of his enemies to be crucified. His fast approaching death was now vivid in his mind, and yet it was not the suffering that he would endure that was uppermost in his thoughts. It was his loving concern for the salvation of lost souls, souls for whom he would earn salvation through his innocent sufferings, death, and resurrection. As Jesus closed their meeting together with prayer, he thought about all the people in the future who would come to believe on him through the preaching of the gospel. You and I were included in his thoughts. Yes, he thought on us all, collectively and individually, and he said, I pray that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. God reveals himself in his word, the Bible, to be one God. At the same time, he presents himself in a perfect and glorious union of three persons that the human mind cannot begin to understand. But what we are able to understand is that perfect unity and harmony exist between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We see this when we read about the creation of all things in the first chapter of Genesis. We see this in God's plan for man's salvation as it's laid out in the Holy Scriptures. We see it in the life and the work of Christ Jesus our Savior. We see it in Christ's rule of this world 
for the sake of rescuing sinners from damnation with his gospel. God is one God, and at the same time, three persons in perfect union and harmony. Our first parents, Adam and Eve, reflected this oneness of the Godhead at creation. The mind of each of them was in perfect harmony with that of their creator. What God wanted, they desired and did. What God called truth, each of them called truth. This is what the scripture reveals when it tells us God created man in his own image. Sadly, that unity and harmony with God ceased to exist the moment Adam and Eve doubted God's love, the moment they distrusted his word. At that moment of doubt, the image of God was lost to our first parents and their offspring as well. At that point in time, a dreadful, sinful change took place in them that was passed on to all of their descendants, the entire human race. Truth for the human being was no longer than what God called truth, but what reason, human reason, concluded to be true. Adam and Eve displayed this change when God confronted them with their sin. Neither of them admitted to his guilt and confessed, I have disobeyed you, Lord, have mercy on me. No. Each of them reasoned that it was not his fault. Adam blamed his wife, Eve blamed the serpent. In reality, each of them blamed God. Their answers reveal that neither of them any longer cared for the truth. They had become selfish, hypocritical fools. The wisdom of God's perfect ways was no longer their delight. They delighted in going their own way, doing their own thing, which they showed in their ridiculous attempt to hide themselves from the all-knowing Creator. When sin entered this world through our first parents, a great and terrible separation occurred between us, the human race, and our Creator. It's so great a separation that God must consider every member of the human race as he is by nature an enemy. It's in most unflattering terms that the Holy Spirit moved Jesus' apostle to write to the Romans, the sinful mind is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those controlled by the sinful nature cannot please God. This is so terrible a, this is so terrible a separation that God must consider every member of the human race as he is by nature an enemy. It's so terrible a separation because it results in an eternal separation from God in hell. But thanks be to God, he was not willing that our separation from him should continue into eternity. He sent Jesus, his beloved son, to reunite us with himself and, and rescue us from damnation. And permit me to remind you again how Jesus reunited us with our creator. He came to this earth and he lived a perfect life as our substitute under God's perfect justice. And then, at the end of his perfect life, he suffered for us in his death on the cross, the punishment that our sins earn. And then, through the comforting message of what he accomplished for us, he sent the Holy Spirit to work faith in our hearts, to trust that we have eternal life and salvation because of what he accomplished on our behalf. By faith, we have been reunited with God, our creator. 
And as a result, we have been turned from our ways of enmity to love God in his holy ways. The Holy Spirit lives in us by the gospel. And he's continually at work through the word to restore in each of us more and more the image of God that was lost when our first parents fell into sin. He works in us the desire to set aside our, our, our selfish, hypocritical, and foolish ways, and he gives us the strength to follow the will of God that is goodness and truth. He works to bring our wills more and more in harmony with God's holy will so that we think and we act more according to God's commandments. He works to get us to set aside our own imperfect reason and to call wisdom and truth only that which God reveals in his holy word. Now, this image restoration is never going to be complete in this life. Always it's going to be hindered by the presence of our sinful nature. Restoration will be complete, though, the moment we enter heaven. Then we will enjoy unity and harmony with God just as Adam and Eve did before their fall into sin. Then we will enjoy unity and harmony with God just as Jesus knew it according to his human nature while he walked this earth. Well, we have now reminded ourselves of the unity and harmony of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in working to save us from damnation. At the same time, we have reminded ourselves of how we have been reunited with God, our Creator. In gratefulness for our salvation, let us struggle with the help of of God to make all of our thoughts and words and actions harmonize with God's holy will so that unity and harmony also characterizes our relationship with one another. And we do this first of all by being united in doctrine and practice of doctrine. Now this doesn't happen by sitting down and letting human minds reason together. Human reason is a good gift from God, but it's imperfect and it's working because of our sinful natures. And so when men reason together to establish truth, truth is either compromised or it's set aside altogether in favor of selfish desires. Truth and the practice of it can result only, only if there is common, humble obedience to God's word, the Bible. Only when human reason is kept subject to God's word. At the same time, it's necessary for each of us to be on our guard against false doctrine. Error never unites. It always divides. It's the tool of the devil. Satan introduced error to Eve. He told her the lie that God was withholding something good from her, something that would benefit her life on earth. Well, where did that error lead? It led to separation from God, from whom all goodness flows, from whom alone comes every good thing, including truth. With error, Satan wants to separate us believers again from God our Savior so that we will serve him in hell. It's absolutely necessary that we be careful not to add to or subtract from God's word. If there is to be unity among us in doctrine and practice of doctrine, each of us must submit his own reason to the word of God. Our attitude in approaching the word of God needs to be like that of the prophet Samuel, who humbly said, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. Let each of us listen carefully and regularly to the word of God so that we grow together in oneness of faith. No one is so well versed in the teachings of scriptures that he needs no more instruction. 
and that includes us pastors. In each of us, there is much room for growth in our knowledge and understanding of God's holy will and saving ways. Besides this, we forget things we've learned. And then, too, we're never without unwholesome influences from the world and our sinful nature that would confuse us and lead us away from truth. All around us, voices state firmly, truth is this, truth is that. They come from religious people, from educators, from government officials, from friends, even from our relatives. If you and I are going to be able to recognize the lie and reject it soundly, we need to always be growing in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Only then will we gain greater insight into the teachings of God. Only then will we increase in our ability to apply the teachings of God to our daily living. As we grow together, as we grow together in the knowledge of God's word, we also will grow in oneness of faith. The more the word rules in our hearts and lives, the greater will become our unity and harmony. Love for one another will grow stronger. There'll be more sharing of sorrows and the burdens of life. There will be a greater dedication to the work of the church. There will be more helping of one another to overcome sin, more encouraging of one another in holiness of living. There will be greater dedication to, the, to serving the Lord. There will be greater patience with each other's weaknesses. A spirit of unity and harmony is going to prevail, and that's a God-pleasing thing. Jesus prayed for it to happen. Unity and harmony among believers is always beneficial for the strengthening and preservation of faith. But it's not only for our sake that Jesus prayed as he did. He prayed as well for the sake of the unbelieving world. He wants no one to be without the benefits of his saving work. His desire is that through our unity of doctrine and practice, many might learn to know him and his salvation. Jesus prayed, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Again, Jesus said, may they be brought to complete unity to let the world know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Now, in and of itself, unity and harmony among Christians does not cause anyone to believe on Jesus as his Savior. It's through the gospel alone that anyone comes to believe. It's only the gospel that God has made his power to convert the unbeliever to faith through the working of the Holy Spirit. But... If the unbeliever can see unity and harmony in our church and in the life of its members, it may well cause him to listen to our testimony of the gospel. Unity and harmony is something for which the people of this world desperately search. Where can one find real peace among people who are so diverse in their talents, abilities, personalities, and culture? It really can only be found among Christians. Men who have common interests and who come from common backgrounds can at times join together in a harmonious group. But it's really only in a Christian congregation that you can find oneness despite differences in talent, ability, personality, and culture. There you can find united in one harmonious spirit the rich, the poor, and the middle class, the skilled worker, the common laborer, and the artist. 
the educated and the uneducated, city people and country people, people who were brought up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord and those who were not, people who lived decent lives, who have people who lived decent lives in the past and those who did not, people with dark skins, light skins, and every color in between, people from different cultures, all different kinds of people, young and old, young and old alike, united by faith in their Savior and showing it in love and patience, kindness, and goodwill toward one another, as well as in their dedication to taking the gospel into all the world to make disciples from every nation. On the other hand, what does it say to the unbeliever when Christians do not evidence oneness of faith? What does it say to the unbeliever when they see that the church is not agreed on the teachings of Scripture? What does it say to the unbeliever when members live contrary to what the Scriptures teach? Doesn't it suggest that the preaching of the gospel is a bunch of foolishness? What will the world think of Christ's gospel if they hear members of a church quarreling with one another, complaining about their pastor or the church leaders, or complaining about the way the church uses its offerings? They will think that the gospel is no better than their own human philosophies regarding life and and that the Christian church is little more than another social organization. It's sad to think that the false doctrines that divide Christendom today and the failures of members to struggle against sin to keep God's commandments causes people to turn a deaf ear to the gospel. But it will only make things worse if Christians ignore departures from God's word in doctrine and practice to be outwardly united. Such a union is hypocritical. It's an agreement to disagree. Without unity of doctrine and practice on the basis of God's word, there can be no true oneness of faith. Now, Jesus was not praying for a super church in his intercessory prayer. He wasn't calling for an ecumenical movement, but he was and is calling for Christians to practice a oneness of faith that begins with faithful adherence to God's word, without false doctrine, and continues with practice that is consistent with God's word. He was and is praying for us to grow in oneness of faith through the word. May each of us be conscious of what a great testimony we can give to the world through unity and harmony around the word of God. When unbelievers can see the love that we have for one another, the concern for each other's welfare, both spiritual and physical, and our peaceful togetherness in working for the good of God's kingdom, well, they'll be more ready to listen to our witness to Jesus as their Savior. And this is what Jesus wants. He prayed for that. For the sake of the world, he also prayed that his believers might be one. So, let us be growing in oneness of faith. We worship one God in three persons, three persons in one God. That's a great mystery. We accept it only by faith. But it's not beyond our understanding how Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are united in saving our souls from the destruction of hell that we deserve because of our sinfulness. So let us reflect among ourselves the unity and harmony of the Godhead by being one in doctrine and practice. Through diligent and regular hearing of God's word, grow together in oneness of faith so that our unity and harmony may lead many to know their Lord and Savior. 
It is an amazing thing. Then in a world that's, that's filled with so much strife and discord, a congregation of Christians can dwell together in unity and harmony. That's God's doing. His undeserved love in Christ Jesus, his Son, our Savior, brings it about. May the Holy Spirit cause us to always be growing in oneness of faith. The peace of God that surpasses all understanding will keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen. you to pull out the bulletin insert that you find in your bulletin here this morning. And in light of what has been going on in our world over the past couple of, of weeks, it seems fitting for us to go to our Heavenly Father's throne and ask him that he would, he would be with us, be with those who are suffering as well. And we do that here this morning both by, by song as well as by prayer. And so you'll see on one side of that bulletin insert a hymn, a hymn that is very fitting to the things that are taking place and then on the opposite side, you will find the prayer of the church. We will begin with the hymn, and then afterwards we will join together in the prayer of the church. But because of the length, um, you may remain seated.
Loving God and Lord, you created the universe that surrounds us and the globe on which we live. You control all things through your Son, who sits at your right hand in glory. Give your word power as it works in our hearts and minds. Clear away our confusion and demolish our doubts. Send your spirit to strengthen both our confidence in your promises and our desire to live according to your will. The signs of the times warn us that the end of time is near. Protect us from scoffers who sneer at your truth. Spare us and Christians around the world from all forms of hate and persecution. Give us Instill in the hearts of our children a desire to follow you as they prepare for future days. Help them distinguish between what is passing and what is eternal, between instant thrills and lasting joy. Encourage more young people to prepare for service in the public ministry of the gospel. Mold us and move us to be examples for our youth. Hold in your care, Lord, those who are experiencing physical or emotional pain, and all who are afflicted by disease or facing death. Especially bless all those affected by war in Ukraine, by recent mass shootings in our country, and by lesser-known acts of violence. Pour out your compassion on the grieving and comfort the mourners who miss someone they loved. Hear us, Lord, as we pray in silence. Whether we pray together or alone, you have promised to hear and answer us. Give us patience to accept your blessings in whatever way you send them. In your love and wisdom, Prepare us for the day when you will take us to be with you forever. Hear us for Jesus' sake. Amen. And we join in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, 
but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We continue with our next hymn, hymn 536.
Blessed Lord, you have given us your holy scriptures for our learning. May we so hear them, read, learn, and take them to heart, that being strengthened and comforted by your holy word, we may cling to the blessed hope of everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you peace. for our final hymn. Good morning to all of you once again, and once again, welcome to all of you, and especially to those who are, of you who are visiting with us today. We'd love to know that you visited with us, and so we'd love to have you sign our friendship register that you find on the square table in the gathering area, and we certainly also welcome you to stick around for some cookies, some coffee, some treats, some fellowship after worship as well. There are a few announcements I'd like to draw your attention to. Some in the bulletin, some that are not in the bulletin. Um, please first take note of the many different things that are involving the Branches Band in this upcoming month of June. Um, the Branches Band is a Wells Band from the Milwaukee area, and they will be here on the 19th of June, which is a Sunday, and that is going to also be our joint service for our picnic. And they will be here, and they will lead our worship in music that day. And then they will also be here on the 21st for our Tuesday in the Park at 7 p.m. And you will find some posters I see in the gathering area on the white table. I don't know if they're on the square table as well. But you will also find some postcards um, on the white table and the square, square table. The postcards specifically speak to the worship service. So if there is somebody that you'd like to invite to that worship service, grab a postcard, hand it to them, and invite them to that worship service. And my guess is the poster maybe highlights more so the concert in the park. So take one and put it around um, in town or wherever you might work as well. Then please also take note that we have purchased new hymnals. And those new hymnals are in, but they suggest that before we use them, we crease them. Um, so that the binding doesn't break on them. 
So I, I ask if you are available after worship on the 12th of June to please stick around and we will have a hymnal creasing party. And, <laughs> and we will crease them after, after worship that day so that it can be put into our, our chairs as well as into our pew at our two locations. And then also take note that there is a newsletter and calendar for the month of June that you can find on the table in the gathering area. We also take time to thank our guest preacher this morning, Pastor David Newman, for sharing the gospel message with us and encouraging us in that oneness that we have and we share because of our common, common faith. And then the, the final announcement that I'd like to, to make to you is that this past week, Tuesday, the Lord blessed me with the opportunity to be able to deliberate two divine calls. As this past Tuesday, a divine call was extended to me to serve at Our Savior Lutheran Church and School in Grafton, Wisconsin. And so, as I have said in the past, I invite and ask that you would share thoughts with me and I'll share information with you as we go along. I will be talking to our church council, asking if they'd like me to put together a call comparison for us to look at once again. And I ask that you would keep the congregation and our Savior in your prayers, our congregation here in your prayer as well, and that the Lord would, would guide me into a God-pleasing decision as I seek to use the gifts that he has given me to the best of my ability and to his glory and where he might use them best. So God's richest blessings to all of you, and God be with you until we meet again.